Yes, please ask questions as we're going. Uh, you know, it's much easier for me to talk to people if they talk back. And my department back in Chicago is like a gladiator ring. You know, the speaker doesn't get more than two minutes in before he starts getting some, some feedback. So that's the culture I'm uh, comfortable with. Um, so the uh, Arctic is kind of a special place in Earth's climate. Uh, it doesn't get the same climate change as you get sort of every place else. And I will kind of tell you about that aspect in sort of broad brush as sort of background. But the main thing I'm going to uh, talk about today is how uh, the Arctic then can in itself, by in responding to climate change, it can actually then influence climate change uh, further. And so you may think it weird to have arrows of cause and effect sort of going both directions, but this happens all the time in natural systems. It's called a feedback loop, and sort of a loop of cause and effect. And in this case, um, what I'm talking about is uh, uh, the Arctic can potentially release greenhouse gases, which could uh, then amplify the initial climate change. So there are positive feedbacks and there are negative feedbacks, and this has the potential to be a positive feedback. So um, to start with um, sort of putting the Arctic into the context of global climate change, uh, there is this phenomenon known as uh, polar amplification of, uh, of warming. And it has uh, mostly to do with another positive feedback called uh, the ice albedo feedback, which I'll show you in a second. But this is a map of uh, temperature changes. This is actually made using this online widget that I wrote for teaching my classes. Uh, uh, I have a Coursera class, actually, with thousands of people who use these. So what I made here is a map of the temperature from a particular climate model in the year 20, 2099. Uh, subtracting from that the temperature in the year 2000. So we're getting the temperature changes. And what you see is there's all these angry red things in the high latitudes where the temperature change was most extreme at the end of this uh, climate run simulation. And this is a very general feature. All the models do this. And in fact, if you look at temperature changes you know, today versus you know, 15, 20 years ago, you see the same sort of pattern that there has been much stronger warming in the Arctic than, than any place else. The Antarctic, I have to tell you, is a bit of a special case because you have uh, changes in the, the polar vortex air that sort of flows around here caused by potentially uh, changes in ozone down there. It's kind of not clear why uh, the southern ocean is not giving as much uh, polar amplification as this model is doing. At, at what you see today, mostly the polar amplification is a, a northern phenomenon. So the ice albedo feedback uh, is another positive feedback. If you have some perturbation to the temperature, like you warm it up, and then you, uh, that makes ice melt. The ice, when it existed, is, was very reflective of sunlight. Sunlight that hits ice or snow can bounce back to space and uh, if it does that, it doesn't actually deposit its energy in the Earth system. It just kind of bounces like a mirror. It's kind of like, you know, when you pay taxes before you get your paycheck. This is like the taxes. You don't see it in the, the heat budget. And so uh, the, you, you warm it up, and, and that ice melts some, some ice, which then causes more sunlight to be absorbed, which amplifies that warming. So this is, again, another positive feedback, and it's mostly you know, operative where there's ice and snow, so the high latitudes. This doesn't really affect Brazil all that much, right? Did, did you have, someone have a question? No. Yeah, Greenland, uh, well, yeah, so uh, I guess in, I don't think that they actually have interactive responding ice sheets in these climate models, because ice sheets generally take thousands of years to respond. We sort of hope they take thousands of years to respond. It could be there's various observations that the real Greenland ice sheet is, is responding more energetically so to. Is a mass, just like Antarctica. So is there a similarity then between? Well, it's an ice, it's a big, big ice sheet, but, but Antarctica is, water. pardon me. It's not water, it's not water. <laughs> so Greenland is a mass, just like Antarctica. 
that true. Yes, yes, like yes, the yes the absolutely. Similarity then? Well, there's similarity in that they're both covered with enough ice that the ice is not actually melting in this model on the ice sheets in this amount of time. The sea ice and the snow on the land, you know, the thin layers of ice that can respond more quickly, those are actually responding in this model. Uh, but uh, so Antarctica is special in that it's sitting on the pole, and so that has special that 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 uh, induces sort of special atmospheric circulations. Greenland is not on the pole. It's uh, um, so the short answer is no. <laughs> to the question, which was well, just are they similar? Well, they're similar in that they're both big enough things of ice that they haven't melted in the simulation. Uh, so um, this is a plot of uh, the extent of sea ice in the Arctic. And this is a shocking thing that the reality turned out to outstrip all of the model predictions of what sea ice was supposed to do, just you know, shockingly worse than, than any of the models uh, sort of predicted. Um, and so, you know, it seems to me like this is sort of the best example of a tipping point in Earth's climate that exists today, because it's definitely sort of changing state. It doesn't actually have as big an impact on the climate as I probably would have thought at the outset, because it's always cloudy up there. So if you have a layer of clouds, they're reflecting most of the sunlight. And then you know, there's less for ice you know, to reflect or, or absorb than uh, there would be if, uh, if that was under uh, clear sky conditions. Uh, one thing that has been happening uh, due to this polar amplification is that there's uh, greater warming in the high latitudes than in the low latitudes, and that changes the temperature difference between the high latitudes and the low latitudes. And that temperature difference, it provides kind of a, a force which drives the, the jet stream. On a rotating sphere, you have this amazing thing which defies all common sense that if you push something this way, it goes that way in, uh, you know, in, in equilibrium on a rotating sphere. So here you're sort of trying to push something to flow from uh, you know, high latitudes to low. And because you're pushing it that way and it's a rotating thing, you get the jet stream going sideways to that direction. And when you change that, that driving temperature gradient, it seems like it may be having an effect on the meanders of the jet stream. Uh, this pattern that we've had going basically, as far as I can recall, the last sort of year and a half We've had two really cold winters in Chicago this last, you know, in the last two, the second of which I was very grateful to miss. Thank you <laughs> very much. Uh, and, and a cold summer as well. So this pattern of meanders of the jet stream leading to weird weather is, uh, th there is an argument which is not yet resolved in the community, but it's a plausible one that this could be resulting from uh, that change in the temperature gradient due to the Arctic loss of sea ice and the polar amplification. Or it could be this is a big butterfly effect. The climate models, if you start them from just very, very different, slightly different uh, initial conditions, can kind of diverge and stay different for, for very long periods of time. So you know, weather is chaotic. It's hard to say exactly what's going on. Is there consensus on why the scale, the scale of the patterns is what it is from the models? Well, you can sort of fit a wave around the planet you know, with a certain number of meanders, and you're sort of stuck with that. And then uh, there is sort of different forcing due to the topography and the different, uh, you know, water and land, you know, heat fluxes and things that, that kind of drives this sort of pattern. So some of this pattern is the reason why, uh, you know, Europe is so much warmer than the equivalent latitude on the east coast of the, the, the US, you know, North America. It's, it's not just the Gulf Stream. It's, it's also this sort of atmospheric wave pattern of the jet stream. Uh, OK, so that's kind of the background of the special role that the Arctic plays in, in global climate and some sort of physical feedbacks that may be, be operating. But what I wanted to talk about more was how the Arctic might be feeding back, this is more of what I know about, uh, how the Arctic might be feeding back to global climate from uh, 
greenhouse gas emissions. And in order to, you know, for, for clarity and to puncture any sort of suspense, I'm going to show you my conclusion slide now, and then we're going to have to go through all the stuff between now and then, uh, and then we'll come back to this at the end. So what I'm going to argue is that the Arctic is certainly a significant player in the carbon cycle on time frames of 100, 1,000 years, sort of long time frames that it takes to melt permafrost and, uh, and uh, the, the submerged permafrost in the ocean I'll show you about. Uh, but there is also a lot of concern in maybe more in, not in the scientific, not in the climate science community, but among people who are sort of really interested in climate science, but maybe not, you know, climate scientism. There's this real concern that the Arctic is going to blow up and really destroy the climate by releasing tons and tons of methane, the methane bomb. And uh, I am not a believer in the methane bomb. So I'll show you why I think all of that. <clears throat> okay, so there are sort of two sources of carbon in the Arctic that are kind of in play if climate starts to change. And one of them is uh, organic carbon on land. So this is a map of uh, how much, you know, what the, the carbon concentration is. Darker colors mean more carbon per kilogram of soil uh, around the world. And what you see is that all the high carbon soils are in the high latitudes. And this has to do with um, not how quickly Plants grow, obviously, because they grow more slowly up there, but rather how quickly the plant parts or the roots or something uh, decompose once the plants die. So if it's frozen, it'll be like you know a frozen meatloaf in your freezer. It'll keep, whereas if you had it out on the counter, it wouldn't keep. It would get degraded much more quickly. So um, if we were to make the whole world have climate that was more tropical, like those lower latitude places, Presumably, in the fullness of time, you'd have less carbon in the soils, and that carbon would come out and, and be added to the sort of fast carbon cycle that we're also adding you know, fossil fuel carbon to. So as the organic material decays, that releases carbon into the atmosphere? Yes. It, uh, it releases, um, there's sort of two different pathways it can take which depend on whether it's uh, waterlogged or not. Because if it's waterlogged, there's, there's no oxygen probably. So if there's no oxygen, you tend to sort of make some CO2 and some methane. So one carbon is getting all the oxidized, you know, the oxygens, the other one's getting, so it's like disproportionating the, the carbon is what they would call it chemically. Uh, and then if it's aerobic, you just oxidize it with oxygen and make all CO2. So, you know, the methane versus CO2 fluxes from some tundra site, you know, maybe a function of the time of year because, you know, the water table fluctuation. So um, there's, uh, if this is the soil column and there's permafrost, which is uh, frozen for some length of time is the definition of permafrost, frozen year round, reaching down to some depth, there may be a, uh, a zone at the top of that, maybe, you know, a meter-ish kind of thickness, uh, which melts in the summer and then refreezes in the winter. That's called the active zone. And so as the, the temperature changes, the active zone can get thicker and, and release more carbon that was frozen to then undergo those chemical reactions and, uh, and react. But another way that happens in the high latitudes, it seems like it's more important is when you have bodies of water around the, the edges of uh, lakes and rivers and, and the coast. So uh, this is my really lousy rendition of what a lake might look like. And underneath the lake, because the water in the lake is not frozen, in the fullness of time, you would expect to have no permafrost. You know, this would thaw down below there because as you go down into the earth, the temperatures get warmer because you have heat coming out of the earth. So you have this thing underneath a lake called a thaw bulb. And uh, all around the periphery there where you have uh, thawed sediment in contact with the permafrost and it's underwater is a really great place 
to, to make methane. So uh, there's this uh, researcher in Alaska named, let's see, yeah, Katie Walter Anthony. And uh, she, she does research on this. Let me sh Students all love this movie. So uh, I don't know what she's saying here. This is just get a second. All right. <laughs> so I puncture a little hole in the ice and then light a match and get this huge fireball. And you know, everybody loves that. So you know, if you don't remember the rest of my talk in a week, you'll probably remember this. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's science. I just love that. All right. So. Uh, Methane gas, yeah, and then you combine it with oxygen and it burns. <clears throat> you could. There's sort of lakes in the middle of nowhere. I don't know that there's that much methane, but so she goes around and, and tries to quantify how much is coming out by shoveling the snow off and measuring the bubbles under the ice. And, you know, it's enough to measure, it's not really enough to capture, but she gets a whole lot right around the ring of the lake. So if you were to put down a sampler kind of at random on the lake, you wouldn't, you would, you would undersample because there's this sort of hot spot of this ring. Same thing happens on the coast where the permafrost is melting and it erodes very quickly, you know, 30 meters a year or something, and you get methane kind of from there too. All right, so the other place where the Arctic could blow up potentially, allegedly, and, 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 uh, and put out a lot of methane is the continental margin of uh, Siberia. So we're talking about this big blob of shallow water right there. So um, this is uh, like 50 to 100 meters deep. So oceanographically, that's very shallow. It's it's almost considered more like continent than 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 ocean. It's continental crust, uh, and it just by coincidence. It, this is like 25% of the, con the, the uh, continental shelf area of the planet is, is, is this big, this big uh, area. And uh, so what happened is during the last ice age, sea level was 120 meters lower than it is today. And so this whole area was exposed to the really cold atmosphere at that time. And, um, Siberia is sort of far enough away from any nice sources of water that you would need to make a giant ice sheet, like the Fennoscandian ice sheet in Europe was fed by the Atlantic. Uh, but in Siberia, it was too dry, and so it just got really, really cold there, and you didn't have a huge, didn't have a huge uh, um, ice sheet forming there. So is that me? There's an incoming call. I'm going to regret <laughs> Uh, so during the during low sea level time during the ice age, the temperature was very cold and much colder than freezing at the surface. And so you start from there, and then you go down the you know in, in the geotherm, the the temperature gradient as you you go down in the Earth gets warmer. And so you you set up for all of this area to be to be frozen permafrost. So we're talking like a kilometer of of uh, of mud frozen all the way down. And then uh, you flood it, and uh, that makes the temperature at the surface of the sediment, you know, follow the temperature of the, of the water, but it takes a long time for that heat to sort of diffuse down into the earth. And it hasn't had time to achieve the equilibrium temperature profile, which would be to just start here and then go up following the geotherm like, like I've drawn it here. And so there's this relic permafrost that's left over from, from, uh, from you know, this, this, this event. And eventually it'll all go away, but it's been sort of getting chewed on by melting from above and heat coming up from below for thousands of years. Uh, sea level started rising about 12,000 years ago, and you know, where exactly it crossed any given place on the Siberian continental shelf depends on how deep the water is, but you know, we're talking thousands of years ago, and it's taking a long time for that permafrost to, uh, to go away, just because it's a lot of, a lot of stuff. 
So uh, I've made this model of how this all works, which I'll show you a, a movie from in a second. But the part that's crucial uh, that, so I kind of figured this out by trying to, to put the different parts of this model together. If I'd been smarter, I could have you know, figured this out from the outset. But nobody else figured it out either, as far as I can tell. What happens is that um, if you're, uh, the question is whether you can have methane hydrate in this permafrost zone. So you've got this kilometer of frozen sediments, very cold. It's sort of low pressure, but uh, there have been arguments that you could have methane hydrate there. And uh, I think that uh, methane hydrate will not be stable there, and, and this is why. Uh, it's because um, both pure water ice and methane hydrate, which is this water weird crystal like soccer ball kind of a structure that has gas molecules in it, in this case methane, um, they get their water from this pore fluid, you know, the water that is there to start with. And it turns out that, that um, ice at some temperature can handle saltier water than methane hydrate can. So what happens if you just have water, ice, and, 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 and salt, and you, you cool it down to some temperature, say there's no methane there at all, so sort of reduce, get rid of that complication. What happens is the water goes into the ice, and the, the, um, the pore fluid that's left behind gets saltier and saltier, until finally the freezing point depression from all that salt in the ice is enough to make to, to match the local temperature. So, you know, you put salt on ice to make it melt uh, because it, the, 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 it depresses the freezing point temperature. Uh, and in equilibrium, that's what happens if you just have a glass of water with some salt in it. You cool it down 10 degrees below zero. You'll get, like, uh, you know, salty water enough so that the freezing point depression puts it at 10 degrees below zero. That's the equilibrium condition. And then if... Uh, if it turns out that uh, ice can tolerate saltier water, it's going to steal all the H2O from the hydrate and make the hydrate not be stable. So uh, this is a, a, a plot. Maybe this is more technical than you want, but we'll just look at it for a second and then move on. It just demonstrates what I just showed you. Uh, this upper plot up there is um, how much salt you want to have in the water in equilibrium with pure water ice as a function of temperature on the horizontal axis and pressure on the vertical axis. So when you make water ice, there's, there's not much change in the volume. So uh, pressure doesn't really matter. You squeeze it, it doesn't change the chemistry very much. And so, uh, those colors are sort of in vertical stripe, meaning that pressure doesn't matter. But as it gets colder and colder, the salinity that is in equilibrium at that temperature goes up and up to about, so the ocean is about here. So this is a little higher than, than seawater salinities. Okay, the middle one is the same thing for methane hydrate. But in this case, when you melt the hydrate, it makes bubbles of methane gas. And gas is uh, compressible. So if you put that under greater pressure, it uh, sort of shoves more methane into the chemical system. And it, uh, it changes you know, the stability of everything. So you get this sort of pressure effect. But otherwise, it sort of looks the same way. And then if you put the, you ask which, you take the, the salinity that's higher, whichever one of those wants the highest salinity, that's, that's this this uh, plot on the right. And then, assuming that's the salinity, if you ask where is methane hydrate stable, it's sort of stable in, these, in this area. And the permafrost regime is sort of all of here. And that's where methane hydrate is not stable. So uh, the equilibrium condition tells you a lot about sort of what the world should be. but the world doesn't always uh, reach equilibrium. Like in the atmosphere, if air is rising and it's very clean, it may get much colder so that the water vapor that's there 
really in equilibrium would prefer to be ice, but maybe if it's too clean, there may not be a nucleation site to make ice. So that would lead to a sort of a disequilibrium. But in this case, say you had some methane hydrate in this permafrost zone, uh, as long as you can make regular ice, which you can always make regular ice, you know, you put a, a, a thing of ice cube, an ice cube tray in the freezer, it doesn't just get stuck for months on end or years or something because there's no nucleation site. It makes ice pretty easily. In that case, the hydrate is going to just decompose and melt. And there's no sort of a transport mechanism that puts hydrate into that zone. If it's not stable, it just won't form and won't be there. So. Um, uh, the conclusion is, if it's not going to be in this permafrost zone, if it's got to be below half a kilometer or a kilometer of sediment, there's no way that warming at the surface is going to make it suddenly blow up because it takes a long time for heat to get down there. In general, the time constant for melting the permafrost on land is a couple of centuries. The time constant for melting this submarine permafrost in the ocean is like a thousand years or something. So, you know, I definitely see all of this in play on the long time scale, but not, not suddenly. So, let's see, here is a movie that shows, uh, so sea level is there, it's, it's rising and falling. The uh, black contours on this side are the, the, the ice fraction. So how much of the water there has frozen into ice? And so where you see those black contours, that's the permafrost zone. And then the red contour here that keeps popping in and out is uh, where methane hydrate is stable. And so you see it never encroaches up toward the sediment surface. It kind of gets capped by this, this layer of permafrost here. On this side, I did a sort of altered reality kind of thing where uh, water can't form pure water ice. So if you uh, let the salinity stay sort of unperturbed because the water ice doesn't steal it, you see the methane hydrate zone gets really close to the sediment surface. And in that case, conceivably, uh, the thing could sort of blow if, if you suddenly started to warm it. But uh, that's not the world that I think we live in. I think we're over here. All right. So. Um, Anyway, the Arctic is kind of a really tiny fraction of the global atmospheric methane budget. Methane is released to the atmosphere from all different places, mostly from tropical wetlands and from rice farming and fermenting, uh, you know, and ruminant animals and things like that. And it goes to the atmosphere where it's sort of well mixed, and then it, you know, slowly decomposes over sort of 10 years or so. Uh, so if you want to really change the methane concentration, you've got to put enough methane in to rival all these other sources, or else you'll just be sort of down there in the noise. And so you see that uh, the Arctic lakes are, you know, a really small source of methane compared to all the others, and the Arctic Ocean is just minuscule compared to that. So on the one hand, I can understand why the Arctic is the focus of people's, you know, kind of crazy obsessions, <laughs> but uh, I just don't see it from, from looking at this. It's a small player in the global, in the global methane budget. So uh, I want to just finish off by telling you a little bit about CO2 versus methane as greenhouse gases. So they are the number one and number two. This graph is showing the, uh, the radiative forcing, which is the watts per square meter of energy imbalance caused by the human perturbation to these greenhouse gases. So uh, in simplest of worlds, the global warming is proportional to the watts per square meter here. And so you can see that CO2 is bigger than, than, than methane today. But those are the first, those are the two biggest ones. Well, CO2, when you release it to the atmosphere, uh, it, um, so this is the airborne fraction of some slug of, of carbon that you release. So this rise here is the fossil fuel era. And uh, the top there, the peak, that would be some hypothetical time when we actually go carbon neutral, if such a thing can be imagined. Uh, and at that point, uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere would 
drop fairly quickly on a time scale of a few centuries as the CO2 sort of spreads out into the rest of the fast carbon cycle. It dissolves in the ocean mostly. But it doesn't all go into the ocean. It doesn't go back down to 0% in the atmosphere because you know, the ocean isn't infinitely huge and you know, that's just sort of how it works out. It turns out there's this leftover CO2, maybe 20% depending on how much we release and you know, how, how it goes, that has to wait for these chemical reactions with, with rocks, with calcium carbonate and with igneous rocks. It's like the whole carbon cycle gets fat when you put this extra carbon in it. And the atmosphere you know, doesn't escape that. It gets fat too. And then the whole thing has to sort of take a long time to, to slim back down again. Uh, the, um, it's, it's sort of accumulating in the system. So it's like a, an odometer on a, on a bicycle. It tells you how many miles you've gone. Methane, on the other hand, is a reactive gas. When you put it in the atmosphere in about 10 years, it will react. Actually, the atmospheric chemistry is a lot like the chemistry of a candle flame. It's very, very dilute, but uh, the, it has these radical, very reactive compounds, same as in a flame, and, uh, and the, the, the methane reacts to make uh, carbon dioxide on this time scale of sort of 10 years. So here's from another one of those climate model things. Uh, if you had some concentration of methane in the atmosphere and then you suddenly start putting more methane in every year, the concentration in the atmosphere will sort of rise until it reaches a new plateau. So the methane is acting more like a speedometer on that bicycle than an odometer. If you want it to go higher, you've got to pedal faster. And if you stop pedaling, it'll drop within sort of 10 years or so to a new level that's appropriate to how fast you're, you're, you're releasing it. So this is what methane in the atmosphere has actually been doing. There's this long period for 10 years or so when it wasn't even rising at all, which is kind of a, a mystery. But uh, in general, it's kind of you know, settling into sort of a new plateau, it looks like. It's accelerating, but it doesn't accelerate as much because it's like a speedometer, like I said. The CO2 would actually be, you know, inflected up. Methane is sort of that way. So, uh, yeah, CO2 is, is like an odometer. Methane is like a speedometer. They, 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 they act differently. So this is a figure that projects how much global warming we can expect through time given various things that we might choose to do or not to do. So the, the green one here is uh, the reference that's business as usual. That's you know, burning fossil fuels and taking no measures to cut either CO2 or methane emissions. The purple curve is if we cut carbon dioxide emissions and don't cut methane or anything else. And because the warming that you get from CO2 at some time is a function of how much, you know, your whole history, how much you've ever emitted, it takes a while for a change in the emissions to sort of uh, diverge here. It sort of takes some time for the temperature to peel off of the business as usual one. And then uh, down here, this uh, blue curve, they leave CO2 alone and they cut uh, methane and, and black carbon, which is another fast-acting climate uh, forcing. And what you see is that it makes a difference fairly quickly, but it, then it sort of parallels the green line because you sort of shave some, you know, some temperature, some, some, some warming off the top. And then the conclusion that you're supposed to reach by looking at this figure which is why they you know, wrote the paper and all, is that if we want to avoid a warming of 2 degrees C, which is something that they're talking, it's a benchmark they're talking about the, the, for the climate uh, negotiations, uh, it's not a danger limit, you know, because 1.9 is not safe. I have a feeling that by the time we get close to 2 degrees C, we'll, we'll think it's pretty insane that we ever thought that was a target to shoot for. But, um, such as it is, that's the, the benchmark that people are talking about. And uh, if you don't cut methane and black carbon as well as CO2, we're going to go past that, that thing. So that's a real conclusion, and I have no trouble with it. But 
after a long period of sort of looking at this plot and thinking about it, I actually come to a completely opposite conclusion by thinking about the lifetime of methane. So here is now, and then here is global warming. You know, when you start to really, you know, the, 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 it's starting to hit the fan here. So we're not there yet. We just sort of see that it's happening, but you know, what we're worried about is 2050-ish kinds of, you know, what happens in the fullness of a few decades. So methane, there's the lifetime of methane, about 10 or 12 years, indicated by the length of that arrow up there. So the methane that we release today has no impact on the temperature when we're sort of worrying about it with, with, with global warming. It, you know, would change the temperature a little bit here, but this is nothing. This is not the problem. And yet, all over the place uh, in, you know, trying to figure out the uh, climate impacts of agriculture or fracking or something like that, they take these as sort of, uh, you know, maybe if we cut methane, that'll buy us time to deal with CO2 later because dealing with CO2 is harder. And, you know, the methane we release today, I don't worry about it. I worry about the CO2 today. So I see it as uh, if we were to cut CO2 now, that would buy us time to deal with methane later. Yeah. I mean, doesn't the methane turn into CO2? It does. It does, absolutely, yes. And so I would count it as carbons coming out. A methane carbon is just as damaging as a CO2 carbon. It's not free like I was sort of suggesting and you just called me on, but, but as, you know, just counting atoms of carbon is the way that makes sense so, to both of us. So in many ways, those people saying we should try and cut off this methane now and be able to <coughs> CO2 later, in many ways, you kind of want to release the methane earlier rather than later. Hmm. If you're assuming you're going to release it at all. Yeah, OK. That's probably true. That's probably, that's, I guess that, 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 that might be true. Although I don't know, yeah. That if we had a choice between emitting methane now and emitting it in 2040, we'd be much, or you know, 2050, we'd be much better off emitting it now. I don't know if there's, you know, such a trade-off of. But anyway, meth yeah, methane today I just don't view as as any worse than just regular carbon. It's big increasing in terms of the total time humans are forcing climate, we're getting closer and closer and closer on this plot to an ocean overturn. If we force it on time scales close to an ocean overturn time, the curves keep going monotonically upward. The, the, Mark is asking about, uh, he's put his finger on what actually sets the time scale it takes to really change the temperature of the planet. So if we lived on a dry planet like Mars, we could run a climate model for a few years and it would equilibrate where the energy flux is balanced. But Earth has this huge heat sink of the deep ocean that, um, that takes a long time to change the temperature of. So if you were to just raise the CO2 concentration to some level and hold it at that new level, it would take a thousand years for the Earth to completely change its temperature. It gets a little more complicated because we're putting it in the atmosphere, the CO2, and then the atmospheric drawdown into the ocean is governed by the same ocean circulation as the heating of the ocean is. So uh, you get this weird result, actually, that um, the temperature kind of reaches this new plateau and sort of stays there for a very long time. Uh, and that plateau is linear. I mean, how much warming you get depends. I'll show this again in a second. Uh, linearly on how much CO2 you release. So it's weird because the uh, radiative forcing is nonlinear in the CO2 concentration. Excuse me for just a moment. I had it. Uh, the, because the, uh, the, it's, it's called the band saturation effect. If you have a little bit of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, it has a much bigger effect on climate than if you have a whole bunch of it. And so there's this sort of thing that cancels out that, that makes it sort of linear again when you have this whole slug of, of carbon, if that answers your question. Uh, anyway, so the conclusions from that last uh, slide are that, you know, global warming, as far as I'm concerned, is a 2050 <laughs> thing. Methane release today will be gone by then. And uh, so it really doesn't 
count for much as far as I, as far as I can see. So this is a web page of people who are really concerned about the Arctic blowing up. It's called the Arctic Methane Emergency Group. They do not respond very positively to a scientist telling them something that bad can't happen. They just sort of have a tendency to distrust that. Uh, and, but you know, maybe you'll believe me, I don't know. Uh, anyway, so to sort of sum up, um, I made a thing for a blog, which I wanted to show you. It, it was called uh, The Importance of Arctic Methane Hydrates to Global Warming in Five Pie Charts. And I was trying to be witty with pie charts here, which is probably a bad idea. But to show you them quickly, and then we're done. Uh, the first two, the importance of methane in the climate system today. So here's how much the radiative forcing from CO2 and methane have changed over the last 30 years. And you know, CO2 is more than methane. That's not a surprise. That looks about like the, uh, the radiative forcing plot I showed you a minute ago. But the impact of what we have released so far on the climate 30 years from now is almost entirely due to the CO2. The methane we release today will be long gone by, by 30 years from now, and so it becomes negligible. Uh, permafrost methane is so much lower than rice paddies and flatulent animals that this is that. This is, this is not the Arctic. So the second, the, the second set of pie charts, uh, the importance of Arctic Ocean hydrates in the global methane cycle today. So that little sliver from the last here, this methane, we're going to blow that up now and see where that comes from. And you see that most of it doesn't come from the Arctic. It comes from everywhere else. The Arctic is sort of a small thing. And then you zoom in on the Arctic, and you see that most of the emissions from the Arctic are from the fossil fuel industry. They're not natural methane fluxes at all. And what's left, there's far more coming from Katie Walters lakes than there is from, from ocean hydrates. And so this tiny little sliver is what that Arctic methane emergency group people are you know, concerned about. I just don't see it. However, on the long run, the Arctic is a significant player in the global carbon cycle because there's so much carbon up there. If you just give it enough time, you will uh, get a large response. And you can sort of see that these are different uh, carbon reservoirs on Earth. And the Arctic ones are here. And, and here, the Arctic is a respectable player. It's, a big, it's you know, more than its size worth of, of uh, carbon reservoirs. Yeah, right, exactly. So, is that This is how much is there in the earth. How much will come out is, is a really good question that will take further work to, uh, to, to answer. And it might. Well, there are a number of reasons why hydrates in the Arctic would be more responsive. The water column is colder, and so that means you can have methane hydrate at shallower pressure than you can other places. The Gulf of Mexico, there's lots of hydrates, but they're all 700 or 1,000 meters down because the warmer water, they need to have higher pressure. And then, of course, the uh, polar amplification makes the climate change in the Arctic greater than other places. So. Uh, you know, there are reasons why it would come out faster there than the global average, yeah. So um, a few last sort of public service announcement slides about the climate change issue in general that you may or may not have seen. Um, they, like I was talking about with Mark a second ago, uh, it's, it's sort of a, a linear relationship between how much CO2 you release and how much warming you're going to get. So to get to 2 degrees C of warming, would take about 1,000 gigatons of carbon that was burned and released to the atmosphere. And we've already burned about half of that, or done about half, 300 from fossil fuels and about 200 from cutting down trees, mostly in the tropics. Uh, and so we're halfway there. And if we kind of forget about natural sources like the Arctic for a second, uh, we have the carbon 
emission rates, gigatons per year, business as usual is, is growing at, at 3% a year or something like that. Shame on us. But if we were to turn it around and start to do some amount of cuts every year, we could start to bring those fluxes down. And you can ask what the, the rate of cutting has to be so that we come in at 1,000 gigatons of carbon. And it turns out that the longer you wait, the faster you have to make the cuts. And you know, making 5% cuts in CO2 emissions per year or 10% or whatever, whatever the, you're trying to do every year is going to cost you money because you have to build you know, power plants or put in insulation or, or, or something like that. So the sooner we start, the cheaper it will get. But then the discouraging thing is to think about these 1,000 gigaton carbon reservoirs uh, in the Arctic and, and you know, within the context of how much carbon we can release and, and stay under 2 degrees C, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of scary. And then about fossil fuels, the thing you have to remember is that to a first approximation, fossil fuels are coal. There's like 50 times as much coal in the earth as there is oil or gas. So we could burn the oil and gas and just go cold turkey on coal and we'd come in at the 1,000 gigatons of, of carbon. So in terms of uh, our, our future, we're going to keep our eyes on the ball. The ball is CO2 emission from coal, not bubbling Arctic lakes. Coal power plants are much more scary. So uh, here's my conclusion slide again. I already told you what was on it twice, so I won't tell you again, but just leave it there. Thank you. Thank you.